Wow, thank you. The rain is great, it makes people come and listen to talks like this, <laughs> so, thank you. It probably took me 15, 20 years as a doctor working in the most advanced bits of the hospital where the machines cost more than your car, the drugs cost more than your car. Um, but it took me that long to realise that words have power. And I think you know, that's why you're all here today, because words have power, whether it's listening to talks like this, poems, story or song. But in hospital, it's the words of patients and families that really have the power. It's not the drugs or, or the machines. And even before writing, I've always been a huge reader. I've loved words. And I don't know about you guys, but the first two places I always look in books are the acknowledgements. I think that tells you a lot about a person, about what they write in that acknowledgement section. So that's the first bit I look at. But the second bit I always look at is the first line of a book. So when it came to writing the second book, uh, which I'm going to be talking about today, called One Medicine, I really wanted to nail that first line. And probably some of my favourite first lines, uh, maybe we can go back to Dylan Thomas, uh, which is to begin at the beginning. We can think about some classics, like it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Or one of my favourite first lines from uh, a, a critique of modern life is, is it just me or is everything shit? It's probably <laughs> one of my top first lines. Uh, but for One Medicine, I hope I've nailed it and I'd like your response today because the first line of this book says, it all started when Barry choked on a hobnob. <laughs> so that's my big entry into literary fiction. Um, but that's the truth. I was working in the intensive care unit, caring for lots of different patients, and all of a sudden a patient got admitted who had choked on an oat biscuit. And in fact, because we're all friends, the truth is it wasn't an oat biscuit. It was actually a jumbo pack of Jaffa cakes, but I couldn't put that in there because of confidentiality, so don't tell anyone. Um, but as, a, as we were caring for him, he'd had a cardiac arrest because of asphyxia, essentially. A flock of birds flew past the window. I'd cycled to work that morning, and it was a rare, sunny Welsh day, and there were loads of flies on my face from, from before I had a shower. And I thought, why don't birds choke on biscuits? You know, not, not hobnobs, but why don't they choke on flies? And that really started my obsession, which ended up with this book, One Medicine. What can understanding the lives of animals do to help patients like Barry who choked on a hobnob or a Jaffa cake which you now know. So to help with that journey I'm going to introduce you to another patient. Uh, you may recognise them. Um, this is Ivan. Ivan was an 18 year old student with the world at his feet and that was until somebody viciously assaulted him. They hit him over the head, he fell over, he hit his head on the corner of a pavement and he had a traumatic brain injury. We first met Ivan in the intensive care unit where you can see from this scan he's got something weird in his mouth, so he was on a life support machine. He's got something missing from the side of his head, which is where part of his skull had been removed. And the reason that had happened was because his brain at the time looked like this. He had actually brain through the area where the skull was removed because of swelling, because of bleeding from his severe traumatic brain injury. But, being in the intensive care unit, in a big academic hospital, we're all very clever. We all know what to do. We've looked at the work of Scottish physicians, knowing about the blood flow to the brain, knowing about how we need to alter blood pressure to make the outcomes for Ivan very much better. And we've, we felt very clever doing that. But the truth is, there have been people doing that for about 25 million years before us. We're not clever at all. In fact, this is Misha, a Rothschild giraffe, who was in the Perth Zoo when my family and I lived in Australia. May have been on many of your walls, actually. She was a, th a famous Athena poster at the time. And Misha has been doing exactly the same as we do for Ivan for about 25 million years, and yet she has no intensive care qualifications. And that's because she has to get blood flow to her brain, 2.5 metres up her neck exactly the same as we needed to do for Ivan. But she doesn't have an intensive care unit. She doesn't have pumps with medications to increase blood pressure. Instead, she uses the thing which she has inside of her, 
which is her own heart. Because giraffes have the highest blood pressure among all land mammals. If she went to see a GP, her blood pressure would be about 300 millimetres of mercury, which is probably double, hopefully, most of yours. Uh, and, you know, that would be a medical emergency at the time. And yet the way giraffes do this on an everyday basis isn't with drugs like we use, it's with their heart. In fact, if you do a scan on a giraffe's heart, you'll need a very long ladder, for a start. It's a bit tricky to do. Um, but it would look something like this. Um, these are pretty grainy images. That's what lots of scans in medicine look like. But if you cheat and look at a giraffe's heart in cross-section, it looks really, really abnormal. If this was a human heart, this patient would have died from something called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or a really bad disease in the heart. It's so thick, there's hardly any room inside. And yet this is a normal heart for a giraffe. And, bizarrely, giraffes suffer from hardly any heart disease. You know, if this was your heart, you would be down your GP in the hospital every day of your life. And the reason giraffes don't suffer from heart disease, we don't know. Uh, we don't know because we haven't thought about it. And we haven't thought about it because they're giraffes, they're not humans. And so, so some of the thrust of this book is really to say, hey, you know, let's bring this together. Let's bring medicine in human species and every other species on the planet together as one in order to learn from the benefits of each other. But that wasn't the end of Ivan's journey. Uh, he'd had a tough time already with a severe brain injury, but the things we'd done had helped. We'd managed to get him through that tough period by getting enough blood to his brain. But Ivan suffered from asthma, and now we noticed his oxygen levels were plummeting lower and lower. His chest x-ray showed maybe some signs of infection too. And being on a life support machine is, is weird, actually. It's something that humans hadn't done until around 1952, when the first intensive care patient in the world, which is this little girl called Vivi, was put on a life support machine because of acute severe polio. These are actually her medical notes, which I tracked down for, for my first book, Critical. And this is actually a, a photo of Vivi uh, here. And this here is a medical student, actually, squeezing a big balloon, keeping Vivi alive for hours, then days, then weeks, and then months at a time. Medical students cycled in shifts to keep around 100 patients alive in Copenhagen in 1952 when polio struck. But we know now that being on a life support machine like this is actually bad for your lungs. It can cause damage if you don't do it in the right way. We've only known that for about 10 years, but of course we should have asked other creatures around the world. If you'd looked at the way a giraffe breathes, a giraffe breathes exactly the same way on a life support machine as we now breathe for patients like Ivan with severe asthma. And that's because it's got a big issue with dead space. If you try to drink a cocktail tonight through a straw as long as a giraffe's windpipe, it would be a problem because uh, you couldn't suck hard enough. The dead space would be too difficult. And so a giraffe breathes very slowly. It's got a very slow respiratory rate. And yet it breathes with a huge tidal volume. Um, probably around double that of a human tidal volume. And that's exactly the same as we did for Ivan. We programmed those settings the way a giraffe would breathe on a life support machine. And it helped. But it didn't help enough. His oxygen levels were sti still pretty low, not really compatible with life in the long term. And so we used a different machine. We used this weird machine which breathes for you at around 300 times per minute. It's called a high-frequency oscillator. It's a big, noisy thing, which takes a lot of power, gets very hot. And again, it's been around since the 70s, and we thought we were very clever using this really cool, fancy machine. And then that night, when I got home, uh, my dog said, well, you're not particularly clever, because we do this every day. In fact, the settings on the machine we used for Ivan were exactly the same frequency as my dog and your dog pants at about 300 hertz. And in fact, the way this works, the physics of this, is exactly the same as a dog breathing. But even this machine actually wasn't enough for Ivan. 
He was looking blue, his fingers were blue, his oxygen levels were still plummeting. And that's when I thought about the January 1992 edition of Reptile Physiology Monthly. <laughs> Any fans? Um, yep, yep, guy in the back. January is the best one, it's probably my favourite. And that's because the January edition includes the Bedouin spiny tailed lizard, which is what this is. An alternative title for my book was going to be How Kissing Frog Can Save Your Life. And the reason for that is because I showed you that photo of Vivi, who has been ventilated via a life support machine, via positive pressure. In other words, air being blown into her lungs, which is the opposite to what you're all doing now. Your air is being sucked into your lungs through negative pressure. But frogs breathe using positive pressure. They inflate the buccal cavity, they squeeze it, and that causes their lungs to expand. Well, Bedouin spiny tail lizards do something even weirder. They breathe at the top of their breath and then breathe in and out at the top of their breath. And that sounds weird, but actually you've all done it in the last few minutes, thankfully. Hopefully, some of you will do one form of it and not another, because you've all laughed. You breathed in, you breathed in and out at the top of your breath. And if any of you cry during this talk, I'm sorry, um, but you will also breathe using this mode of ventilation. And we now use this mode of ventilation in intensive care called APRV only in the last 10 years and yet the Bedouin spiny tail lizard has been doing it for about 50 million years. Sadly, Ivan's oxygen levels continue to plummet. They continue to get lower and lower. And that's when I thought about this person here called Casper. I interviewed Casper via Zoom about two years ago because of COVID, I couldn't visit him in Copenhagen. But Casper was one of six children who all died. They all died about five years ago in a boating accident on a frozen lake in, in just on the outskirts of Denmark. It was a school trip, a particularly cold day. The wind whipped up, the boat capsized and all six children drowned. The water was super cold, below zero, and all six children were relieved by the lifeguard, all to be pronounced dead at the scene. They had no heartbeat. But you were not dead until you were warm and dead. And they were cold and dead. And so they, all six children were taken to the local hospital, placed on a special machine which added oxygen directly to their bloodstream. And after around six hours of having no heartbeat, all six children survived, including Casper. Casper uh, is now married to a swimming instructor, believe it or not. Uh, and five of the other children are all doing pretty well. Some have been left with ongoing issues, from cognitive issues to physical issues, but they all survived. And they survived for the same reason that this person survived. This is Chris Lemons, who is a British saturation diver who spends all of his life at the bottom of the Antarctic Ocean. They sleep there, they live there for up to a month at a time. They don't surface in order to have, avoid the bends. Sadly, Chris Lemon's oxygen supply was severed for 40 minutes, and this was a picture of him lying on the bottom of the ocean, fitting, seizing, where he was for nearly an hour. And yet, when he was rescued, the only thing he needed to survive was a cup of tea and a tea cosy which he put in his head because he was so cold. Chris went back to work two weeks later. And the reason the children survived and the reason Chris Lemon survived is the same reason as the beer you'll hopefully be drinking tonight tastes good. And that's because it's cold and it's under pressure. And having liquids like blood or beer, which is cold and under pressure, means that gas solubility is higher. And so dissolved oxygen in the bloods of Casper and in the bloods of Chris Lemon allowed them to survive. And we should have known this long ago. Uh, this is the Terra Nova that set sail with Captain Cook, just on the headland around Penarth, actually not far from here. And as well as discovering new places, the Terra Nova also discovered new creatures. One of those creatures was a bizarre animal known as the ice fish completely transparent, it has no haemoglobin in its bloodstream 
and yet it has the genes for making haemoglobin, but it doesn't bother making it. And the reason for that? The same reason Chris Lemons and Casper survived. It lives at the bottom of the Antarctic Ocean under extreme pressure, under extreme cold, and it purely survives on dissolved oxygen. Now, as an intensive care doctor, I can't uh, do a single talk without mentioning the word COVID. Uh, that was a big part of my life, my family's life, all of your lives. And one of the big lessons actually from COVID, bizarrely, comes from one of the smallest creatures in my book, and that's the ant. In the middle of the pandemic, there's a researcher in Bristol, a very talented uh, person who had a PhD, and looked at the lives of ants and how they survive pandemic outbreak. And I'm sorry to say this may come as a big surprise, but ants do things better than politicians. <laughs> when they have outbreaks, they socially isolate, they look after their young, they close their schools, they spray antiseptic on each other, they wash their hands, they protect the vulnerable in society by changing the routes through burrows they take, such as the Queen, and they vaccinate each other through small amounts of infection. In summary, ants probably did a lot better than we did uh, during COVID. So it's not just the big animals that can teach us lessons, it's even those tiny ones and draw our feet. But it's also the big ones. And again, in COVID, a lot of the patients we cared for, who had very low oxygen levels, we cared for by turning them over onto their front. That was hugely effective for increasing oxygen levels. We thought we were very clever doing this. It's only been done in intensive care patients for about 10 years. And yet, if you talk to gamekeepers in Africa, this is routinely how they transport rhinos. If you transport rhinos the right way round, they die. They die because of lung collapse. And so they routinely put them on their backs actually attach them to helicopters, which is what this rhino is attached to, and transport them across the plains of Africa. Now, there is a trigger warning. There's some children in the room. Uh, I'm a middle-aged man, and the next slide has a photo of me virtually naked. <laughs> uh, I say virtually because there, there is something there to hide all the essential bits. But there's a good reason I was naked, and the reason was... I wanted to get bitten by about a hundred midges. I say a good reason. It doesn't want to show my bottom. <laughs> I don't blame it. Um, so I, I travelled to a very small island just south of Skye called Elan Shona in Scotland, which is beautiful. It's owned by Richard Branson's uh, sister, actually. And I went there on purpose because it has no electricity, no running water. I wanted to finish writing the book and it has a huge amount of midges. Uh, now, midges probably cost the Scottish economy around £5 million a year. There's a great story of a school teacher who did a round-the-world trip all the way from his home in Glasgow. He got within 50 miles of completing the trip and quit because of the midge season had, <laughs> uh, had come. But the reason I took my clothes off and covered myself in honey this particular night um, <laughs> was because it didn't hurt. When I was bitten a hundred times, at the time, it didn't hurt at all. It was excruciating afterwards, which the Scottish whisky helped, but wouldn't it be amazing if we could truly develop pain-free injections in diabetes, in vaccination, in a huge amount of other causes? And the reason it didn't hurt is because midges, just like mosquitoes, are better than phlebotomists. They are better than us in intensive care. They insert needles in a particular order to minimise pain. They have a heat-seeking tip, so they hit your blood vessels the first time, much like we use in ultrasound nowadays in intensive care. They also spit in an anticoagulant, so the blood doesn't stick as it's coming through the tiny needle. Uh, in summary, midges can take blood much better than intensive care doctors. Now, there's a big film in the cinema, cinema at the minute, Oppenheimer, so I couldn't not... Uh, just very briefly mention a character in the book called Osama Shimamuru, who is a Japanese scientist who was actually in the Hiroshima bombing at the time. He survived. He was covered in radioactive dust. His gran took that cotton shirt off, which is probably the only reason he survived. But amazingly, 50 years later, he had developed a technology 
which will have been used for everybody here if you've ever really gone to a lab, if you've ever had cancer, if you've ever had a biopsy or a histology taken. He developed a technology called GFP, green fluorescent protein, by looking how jellyfish cause luminous light to be transmitted. And 50 years after nearly dying in the atomic bomb, he actually gave his Nobel Prize speech in Los Alamos with the very uh, parachute which he saw as a 10-year-old boy descending in the corner of that room. And in the book, I track a story of the patient he saved with this technology who actually was working at the time on that atomic bomb program. Um, and so, uh, for me, that was a very strange, beautiful bringing together of people. Now, we've been talking about Ivan, the person who had a traumatic brain injury. He survived that initial assault. We got him through with the power of the ice fish, so we got his oxygen levels just to where it, they should be. But now came a new problem. His heart was in a bizarre rhythm. We were using drugs to treat infection, and those drugs can cause problems with your heart. He had one of the most common arrhythmias that some of you here may have had. He had what's called AF, atrial fibrillation. But nowadays, we can treat that with lots of fancy means. We can treat it by destroying some of the electrical circuits in hearts. But the reason we know how to do that is actually thanks to one of the biggest creatures in the book, which is the whale. This is a whale's heart. It's about the size of a grand piano. And in order for electricity to pass through it, it kind of defies the laws of physics. The reason your heart beats at 60 times a minute is because that's how long it takes electricity to pass from the top to the bottom. That's about half a centimetre in humans. But in whales, it's about half a metre. So if you had to wait for the electricity to pass half a metre, a whale's heart shouldn't beat. And there's a specific name for that, which is called a, a PR interval, which is that gap between the top and the bottom. And there was a heart doctor fascinated about what is the PR interval in a whale, because it, it shouldn't work, it shouldn't exist. So what they did to find out is they tried to do an ECG on a whale, a heart recording on a whale, which was tricky, especially because they unfortunately went uh, to South America during mating season, um, which is not the best time uh, to do an ECG of a whale. Oh, sorry, some minor technical difficulties. Talk amongst yourself. So if you remember nothing else from this talk, there's one very important thing in, that vid in this video that you're seeing, which is a whale's penis is called a Pink Floyd. Okay? <laughs> so that's all I want you to remember. So it was a great talk, Pink Floyd. I don't know what came first, the band or the penis. Um, but unfortunately, they went in mating season, so the Pink Floyd was a big problem for them. It was especially a big problem because whales mate in threes, and they had a very small boat with a very big ECG machine. So the scientists who went nearly died, actually, uh, which I don't know what they would have written on the death certificate, death by Pink Floyd. Um, but they returned a few years later, and I'm pleased to say they managed to successfully record an ECG of a great whale. Uh, and this is the unprocessed recording, actually. And what's unbelievable about this is that that gap I mentioned in humans, which is about half a centimeter, half a meter in whales, the time it takes in humans is only half of that in the whale. So effectively, they use a completely different mode of conducting electricity in a whale's heart. And that's now used today for people who've had therapies like ablation, if you've had AF, Tony Blair and other people had it as well. And it's thanks to the whale's heart and partially that trip that those scientists did that that can actually work. Now, I've mentioned Australia, and my family and I travelled to Western Australia uh, a few times in our life. It was beautiful, the coffee was good, the weather was amazing, but we hugely missed the beauty and the culture of Wales. Um, <laughs> also missed my mum a lot. You can see she was very happy when uh, we returned. Um, so we returned to bad coffee, lower pay, uh, rain and my mum. Um, but I learnt a lot when I was there. And one of the people I worked with was a chap called Barry Marshall. 
Uh, Barry Marshall was a, I'm going to give up with that, a gastroenterologist who was thrown out of his lab for suggesting that ulcers, gastric ulcers in humans, weren't caused by stress or spicy food, that they were actually caused by infections. And the reason he thought that is because his family actually grew up working in agriculture. They actually owned um, a cattle business. And there was a common problem in cattle causing ulcer disease. And he put those two things together. He was laughed out of his lab. He was actually sacked from his job. And then six years later, he was awarded a, the Nobel Prize in Medicine for finding the bug Helobacter pylori, which now pretty much has transformed ulcer disease. But as well as that, Barry Marshall now is particularly interested in this new concept of faecal transplant. And I say this because Ivan was given a lot of antibiotics, but he developed severe diarrhoea. He developed Clostridium difficile, a problem of the bowel by overgrowth of a bad bacteria, if you like. But if you look at the koalas in Western Australia, where we lived, they actually didn't have koalas there at all. They introduced them and they all died. And the reason they died is because they couldn't digest the local eucalyptus. But the park keepers knew that baby koalas eat their mother's faeces as soon as they are born. It's called pap. And that actually gives them the microbiome, the bugs, the bug mix needed to digest the local eucalyptus species. So if you travel to Perth, to Western Australia today, you can go and see those koalas in a place called Yanchep who are surviving there because they actually imported faeces and fed it to those koalas. And again, in humans, this is now, in fact, there's one of the largest stool banks in the world in Birmingham, claim to fame, everybody, uh, that you can visit and you can even donate your own stools. Okay, so um, if this talk motivates you to do anything, there are lots of toilets around, uh, please do that. Whilst we're on the topic of Australia, I can't not mention the kangaroo, uh, mainly because I've mentioned Pink Floyd, I have to be gender balanced, and I have to tell you that koalas have three vaginas. The reason they have three vaginas is partially because they actually nurture young throughout the entire cycle. They can have up to three joeys in a pouch, another one developing in the womb. And this has actually transformed the care of patients who need IVF, including Louise Brown, the first IVF baby, uh, who actually was uh, produced thanks to the knowledge of the way that kangaroos uh, allow implantation as well as fertilisation. Fertilisation is actually the easy bit. Implantation was tricky, and it was studying animals like the marsupial, which allowed IVF to happen. We have a good friend who had natural triplets, actually, uh, and they were born very prematurely. They were very ill. One of them in particular, called Joe, was on the brink of needing to go onto a life support machine. And the thing that trans transformed that and made things a lot better uh, was this. Uh, they call it kangaroo care, but it sh probably should be called primate care. And it was the power of touch. I interviewed Robin Dunbar, a famous anthropologist who came up with Dunbar's number, the number that humans can maintain uh, group contact with through social networks or in reality but he's also described how there's receptors in your skin which respond to only light touch at around three to five meters per second that releases endorphins more powerful than heroin and it's been shown in premature babies mother's touch dad's touch light touch at five meters per second actually reduces the amount of help from breathing machines and from drugs that babies need. And those same receptors are also in our middle ear that respond to tones which are deep, about five hertz, and the frequency exactly the same as a mum's rock, exactly the same as a nursery rhyme. And so it's no surprise that chanting and meditations and various other traditional cultures replicate that frequency and that tonality, which actually re releases endorphins. And I'm pleased to say, as a result, uh, Joe is now a very healthy boy. This is him uh, with his mum, actually. However, things were tough for Ivan. Uh, we had many talks with his mum and dad where I would say words like, he's sick enough, he may die. And intensive care is a place where around one in five people die. We can't always save a life, but we try to save a death even when that happens. We have to be experts in end of life as well as trying to save lives. 
And this is somebody who struggled with that for a long time. This chap is called Kevin Hines. He is in what we call the 2% club because he is one of 2% of people who tried to die by suicide by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco and yet he survived. And the reason he survived is because of two things. The first reason he survived was actually because of a sea lion, which he called Herbert, which kept him afloat. There is a video of this. The Coast Guard actually saw it. He kept Kevin afloat for probably around 20 minutes until he was formally rescued. And the second reason Kevin is alive is because then he had help from therapy animals, uh, a dog and a cat in particular, we now have a range of therapy animals in the intensive care unit, in palliative care settings, which just like that touch in premature baby skin has been shown to reduce the amount of painkillers people need, reduce the amount of time that they actually spend uh, on a life support machine. But it doesn't always work and uh, death is a common companion sadly, especially through Covid where people couldn't be there. That was probably the toughest times for us as healthcare providers and, and you all as family members. But there's still things we can learn from animals. This is Dorothy. Uh, Dorothy was the matriarch of a primate group who died, uh, died of natural causes. And as she was being pushed in a make makeshift, this is a wheelbarrow actually, where she was being taken out to be buried, all of her primate group straight away, without any prior knowledge that this was happening or any warning signs, became completely quiet, gathered around, hugged each other, touched each other, put their hands through the fence and tried to touch Dorothy. And it used to be said that death is where the home is or home is where the death is, but now, although nine out of 10 of us want to die at home, around nine out of 10 of us will die in a hospital setting. And yet it's shown that end-of-life care like this, where you are there, where family are there, where people are touching, holding, caressing, actually can reduce post-traumatic stress. It can reduce grieving reactions as well. And so even when things don't go according to plan in intensive care, there's probably things we can learn from animals like Dorothy. But what about Ivan? He had survived an assault. He had survived a severe lung infection. He had survived a severe bowel infection with, with C. diff. And I wish I could tell you that the story was all good news. It was still tough. We still had endless conversations with his parents about what the future may look like. Yes, he got through that, but brain injuries are tough to predict. He loved rugby, he loved football, he loved singing. Would he ever go back to doing those things again? And Ivan can't be here with us today, um, but he has sent us a message. Can't hear that at the back. Physically, I'm nearly back to how I was before the attack, okay. although I still tire very easily. Bad button to press. <laughs> you all know my password now. <laughs> Good news is, I'm back playing football. I play football for my local Welsh speaking team, Club Cymric. Uh, but I'm not allowed to head the ball, and I've got this padded headband instead. When I woke up from the cold run, my first language was Karai, where it's been, well, has been and still is very strong. But my English language, well, I still struggle with, with it today, as you can probably see. But last year, I joined the male, male choir. And we sing in all these different languages. I can't even I can't even say which ones. But we also had the incredible experience to sing here in the Millennium Stadium. I'm allowed to use a copy of the words and the music to sing in a competition like here. 
So although intensive care can look scary, uh, this is what I see every day, surrounded by machines and expensive drugs, actually uh, the truth is it's not about those things, it's about simple things. During lockdown for this book I was meant to go to the Galapagos Islands and see the giant turtles and travel the world and instead I found myself underground in a cave with a man called George, who is this? George Nash, a great archaeologist. And he showed me one of the oldest cave paintings, actually, in Wales. This is cave art in the Gower. And the thing the humans have drawn is an animal. This is a giant uh, deer. And the amazing things about a lot of cave art in the UK and in Europe is it's super accurate. We used to know, we used to understand where animals were, how their bodies worked, what they looked like. This is a giant mammoth with a heart in the right position of the right size. And yet we've lost that relationship. The fact now, most of the time, you meet animals as a filling in a sandwich. You know, that's weird, that's not right. And it has implications for the world, and it has implications for medicine too. And so my hope is that we can show people that actually human medicine and animal medicine should be brought together, it should be brought together as one. So although the book is humorous, it's got some interesting stories, it's got some science, it's hopefully got an important message. You know, why are we training doctors and vets separately? Why isn't that happening together? Why are the departments of veterinary science and human medicine completely separate and not learning from each other? Why is it that I swore an oath to one species on the planet and yet veterinary scientists, veterinary nurses swear an oath to every other species on the planet? And we've learned through things like COVID, the pandemic, climate change, this is just a, a ridiculous setup. You know, this should be one world, this should be one species, it should be one medicine and hence uh, the title uh, of this book. Now, I started at the beginning with uh, the first line of the book. I looked on, on Kindle, actually, before coming here, about the most quoted and the most highlighted passage, and it can tell you a lot as an author about the things people value. So I'm going to read you two last quotes to finish. Uh, at the end, there are some books down here if, if you'd like some. I'm happy to scribble and write something in there. They're available from all good and bad bookshops. But the most quoted passage in the whole book, I am sorry to tell you, <laughs> was this, and I can hardly see that, I'm going to read off my screen instead. It is, although poetic in many ways, and this is talking about embryology, I'm trying to explain that we all come from a very similar embryological background. Although poetic in many ways, we know the first part of the embryo to develop in the womb is the end, or the arsehole. <laughs> Basically, you were all once just an arsehole. <laughs> Some people never change. <laughs> so thank you to the community for highlighting, you know, five years of hard work, science and research, and basically laughing about a joke about an arse. Um, but the quote I am going to leave you with, which hopefully summarises the book better, is this. Some people talk to animals. Not many people listen, though. That's the problem. Thank you for listening, and thank you for your time. <laughs> <laughs>